One, two, check, check. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Word. It's literally that one person said something. Good afternoon, everybody. So I've heard a lot. Well, I've been to Germany a number of times. I actually really love it here. And I know you guys are pretty like. So I got to let you in on a secret, because if I can be lively right now, I think you guys can too. I've been terrified for the last 10 hours. I'm going to tell you why. Because I got on a flight in New York last night, and it was over an hour and a half late getting to Amsterdam. And I got to Amsterdam, and I missed my connection. And I've been terrified ever since then. Because of the fact, as a black person, there's certain things you can't do. I'm going to tell you about a couple of those things. One, you can't time travel too far back in the past. You can laugh at that. It's OK. <laughs> Two, you can't, um, what's the other thing? You can't do that. And you can't be late for things, because you just make your whole people look bad. So all that said, I am very tired. I have not slept. So if I can be lively right now, you guys can be lively. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. OK, so we're going to talk about the content marketing overhaul today. And I'm actually going to overhaul that title right now and call that Scaling Quality Version 1.6. And I call it Version 1.6 because I'm all about repurposing stuff. And this deck, I've continued to improve over the last year. So you guys are going to get all my secrets on content marketing. And I know we got off to a rough start because you didn't laugh at my jokes, but that's OK. So I have a tendency to go quite quickly. You might want to just grab this URL. I'll tweet it later. So if you don't grab it quick enough, you'll have it later. Anyway, so everybody's talking about content. I'm sure numerous people got up and said, hey, content is king. Content is so important. Content is the currency. And a lot of people, they expect this when they do content marketing. So this is a study that Eloqua did where they compared PPC to content marketing. So they said PPC is the most efficient channel. You put a dollar in, you get $5 back, right? And then what they said is that content marketing Content marketing actually compounds over time. So those assets that you create will yield more conversions, more dollars over time, because these are things that will continue to drive traffic. And so people expect a lot of this. But they get a lot of this. And a lot of this. Because their content looks like this. Seriously, what is that? <laughs> So the thing is that there's no excuse for bad content in 2015. In fact, there hasn't been a good excuse for bad content ever. But you know, for a long time, you could just make terrible stuff for SEO, and then you get traffic and whatever, whatever. But the reality is there's so many art school kids that can't get jobs, so many kids that went to school for journalism that can't get jobs because journalism is basically dead. We have BuzzFeed now. So the other thing is that there's more data than ever. People are telling you every inane, mundane thought that they've ever had on a variety of social networks. You can mine that data to create content experiences that are very interesting. And I think where marketers tend to fail is that they conflate the ideas of content strategy and content marketing. So if you make an infographic, you put it on the internet, and you hope that you get some shares, likes, and links, and traffic, yeah, you've done content marketing. But if instead you build a system to figure out what type of content you're going to create, who you're creating for, how are you going to maintain that content, where are you going to source it from. If you've done all those steps, then you're doing content strategy. So I believe, and from my experience, content strategy is very much the answer. You're going to see this a few times throughout the deck, because I'm going to give you workflows on how to implement some of this stuff. But basically, when I say content strategy, I'm talking about starting from the audit phase, where you're trying to figure out what you have that's already performing and what can do better. And then from there, you're coming up with a strategy. How are we going to approach the content that we're going to create moving forward? And then we're going to plan out the actual creation of that content, then create the content, launch it, maintain it. And the cycle continues, right? And the other thing I want you guys to think about is the diversification of content types. When you think about content marketing, you typically think of you know, maybe doing some drip campaigns. You'll do some blog posts. You'll do some infographics, maybe some ebooks and videos. Everything you see up here is content. In fact, these people videotaping me now have three more forms of content. 
They can put my video on the web. They can get a transcript from that. They can write about the video. You know, there's a number of ways that you can approach content. When I led marketing for a digital marketing agency, one of the first things I created was a comic strip. I wasn't like, hey, how do we do so many blog posts? Because I knew I couldn't do as many blog posts as was required to keep up that cadence. So knowing that I had a content type that was actually interesting to people that wasn't that hard for me to make, we did that before I started writing blog posts. And we had some outsized returns from that. So the other thing that you always need to be focused on is the return on investment. Because if you're not thinking about ROI, you're essentially just doing an expensive form of arts and crafts. I don't want you guys to get fired, so keep thinking about the money. All right, and the other thing is that you want to map your content to different need states or different phases in the user journey, and then map those need states to the right KPIs. It doesn't make sense for you to measure infographics based on sales. Nobody looking for an infographic is like, huh, I want to buy the thing in this infographic. That doesn't happen. So what you want to do is map those to things like links, shares, traffic, whereas a buyer's guide is a much lower funnel piece of content. So then you want to map that to sales. So let's talk about content planning. How do we get you the right tools to effectively plan out your content strategy? Well, there's a tool called Mural Lee. It's a great tool for brainstorming. Uh, it's a collaborative tool. So they call it you know, Google Docs for visual people. You and your entire team can just be collaborating on this board, bringing in the things that you're seeing on the web that you like, so you can have kind of a mood board for the things that you're looking to create. Storyboard that. You're looking to create any type of visual content, like a video, or you're thinking about com content, uh, comic strips, like I said before. Anything that has a sequence of events that is visual, you can use storyboard that with all the assets that they have built in to build out that storyboard. And if you're building anything like a new web experience, like a infographic, Balsamic is perfect for that. Everything I'm going to show you today is going to be freemium. There's going to be something that you can play with right now without paying money, and then figuring out if this is something you actually want to use. Gliffy is very similar to Balsamic, except it also has uh, components for you to build out the different process documentation that you're going to need for a content strategy. So you want to build flow charts and things like that in the cloud, I hate saying it in the cloud, um, you can use this tool for that. And then for managing this entire process, your editorial calendar that you would look to create, you can use Asana. I used to be really big on Trello, but Trello doesn't have the project management features that I like, like reminder emails and you know, specifically assigning components of projects to people. You'd have to make a million cards for this type of stuff. And they do have a calendar view, but I, I just prefer Asana. And then the other thing to think about is that great content has great structure. So both of these pieces of content are written by the same gentleman, a, a guy named Rand Fishkin from Moss. And the one on the left has more structure, more skimmable visual structure. It got more links, more shares, more time on site. And then the other one is like a wall of text, much lower, everything, all metrics across the board. And I can tell you as somebody that writes really long blog posts, that people don't really read them, but they think they're smart. So they share them and link to them. You guys don't laugh at shit. <laughs> so how do I find good ideas? I get this question a lot because you know we specifically come up with good ideas at scale, right? And a lot of this is about the process. How do we effectively do this across so many different verticals? Because we're not a verticalized agency. So we always start from content auditing. And I'm going to walk you guys specifically through how to do the world's greatest content audit. And the main tools that we use here are Screaming Frog, which I'm sure all of you already know about, and another tool called URL Profiler. So the reason why we use the two together is because URL Profiler has some limitations in that it doesn't crawl by just popping in a domain name. You actually have to bring the URLs to it. So we also build personas. And personas are a key input in the content audit that we're looking to create here. Because you want to understand the person behind the visit. Who is most likely to be landing on your website looking for this type of content with regard to your target audience? And I believe this is where Google is headed. These two screenshots actually come from a Google webinar where they talk about something they, they have called the database of affinity. So on the left side, they're explaining what this database of affinity has been applied to thus far. And we're, we're in this phase here 
where it says smart affinity, where they're essentially allowing you to use this, this affinity database to target against people across the web. So if you guys remember, in the end of 2011, Google actually consolidated their privacy policy so that all the Google products can talk to each other, so to speak. So all the data from your Gmail and your Google wallet and your search history and all this stuff can essentially be mined to figure out what type of person you are. And they're already doing that right now with something that they call affinity segments. So if you're doing paid media in Google, you can already target against these, these different profiles that they segment essentially everybody in the world into. And the cool thing about that is that you can effectively track that in Google Analytics. So I encourage everyone to set up those demographic and interest reports so that you can get this data and then segment your analytics based on these different personas that you might build. So there's a lot of data sources for this type of stuff. You know, there are a number of companies out there that do market segmentation at scale and offer these different frameworks for it. Experian Mosaic is one that we use heavily. Um, this is actually the, the free Mosaic interactive guide for Germany, so I encourage you guys to check this out. It gives you a ton of data where they've segmented everyone in Germany, and you can leverage this data in building out your personas. So the first thing you want to do is state your goal. Now, what we're seeing right here is actually the result of me scraping 14,000 user profiles from the Moz website. And I know that Moz as a company is looking to reach or have more subscribers that are small business owners that spend a lot of time on SEO. So the interesting thing here is that of their people that spend 50 hours a week on SEO that are business owners, most of these people, or you know, the biggest segment of these people are basic subscribers, which means that they don't pay for the service. They just have an account. So these are the people we want to reach. Specifically, what is it about them or about the service that makes them not want to subscribe? So you can use Google's Display Planner to have demographics to frame any segment that you're building. So it's equally valid for me to say, you know, females between 25 and 34 that use desktop, as it is to say, males between 18 and 24 that use mobile. And this data allows me to really understand that without taking a deep dive. So this way you can see which pockets of the audience do I want to focus on. Then you want to collect user needs. And MozMix is very easy because they have so many sections of the site where people can give feature requests. In the profiles, people say what they're interested in. And you know, there's other sections for Q&A and such. So you can collect all these user needs pretty easily with this site. For other situations, you might have to go more, a little deeper. And then you want to observe psychographics. So social media is incredible for this. You can do um, Facebook graph search. In this case, I looked at people that are interested in Moz, but I'm not connected to. And then I can just look at you know, what, what things do these people collectively enjoy. You can do the same thing with a tool called Twitterland, and then also with uh, Twitter's advanced search as well. And then you bring it all together. So the answer to the question, why are these small business owners that spend so much time on SEO not subscribing to Moz, I mean, some of you are actually in here, so you know why, but you know, a lot of these people are living that four-hour work week lifestyle. They don't see the value in Moz because of the fact that you don't get more premium content by signing up. You don't get a la carte pricing. You don't get a mobile app. You also don't get multi-seat accounts. So these are all things that I was able to identify in this research and then segment these people into these different groups. So, I wrote a 12,000 word blog post about personas. And it got a lot of thumbs up, a lot of shares, a lot of likes. And I realized I have some issues with it because a lot of people just hit me up and they're like, that sounds like it takes like way too long. I'm never gonna do that. Do you have a quicker way? And I was like, but I wrote 12,000 words for you. You can do this perfectly. And they're just like, all right. And I was like, all right, my bad, I got you, I got you. I'll do something else. I'll give you the fastest way I know how to build segments. Now, step one, get your mailing list. If you're content marketers, you should all have a mailing list. And a lot of people don't think about email in the same context because it's not a sexy channel. But get your mailing list, continue to build your mailing list. Run it through a tool like Full Contact. I don't know how much data Full Contact has for the German space. I'm sure there's a similar tool like this out here. I just don't know what it's called. But run it through a tool like Full Contact. And then you're going to get all this data appended to your email 
list. And let me just be clear about what full contact is. It's a data store where you can basically hand them an email address and they're gonna give you demographic data, they're gonna give you psychographic data back, the person's name, where they work, so on and so forth, right? And then you can take the list of um, Twitter, it's not, oh there it is, Twitter names from people on that list and then throw it into Demographics Pro. Demographics Pro is very similar in that it appends um, demographic and psychographic data from Twitter to that list. It's gonna generate a 21 page report that tells you a lot about your audience. Other thing that you can do is upload your mailing list to Facebook's audience insights. And the way you do that is, it's like you're creating an ad, you upload the list, and then you go back to the Facebook's audience insights tool, it's gonna give you all that demographic data right there as well. So, if you don't have a list, you can just use this tool. And this tool is pretty much valid anywhere, because you know, Facebook has 1.2 billion people on it. And then you can segment your data based on the different data points that they have. So, in this case, I was looking at the women between 25 and 34, and then I can see the rest of the features of this audience. And this process is like five minutes. The other thing that's really cool, and this only really applies to the US as far as I know, I don't know if they do it here as well, but they marry that data with a, another one of those market segmentation companies called Axiom, and you can get the profiles directly from there as well. And then you can actually go to their profile um, definitions and leverage data from there. Ultimately, whatever you get out of these tools, you definitely want to check it against your Google Analytics data because you can, again, measure those affinity segments and see if that aligns with the people that you're looking at on Facebook. More often than not, or not just Facebook, but the other, um, the other social networks as well. But more often than not, I'm seeing that it does align. So from there, you bring those data points together and you build your personas. Like I said, that's more or less a... 10, 20 minute process, depending on how good you are at using APIs. So, the next step is building a user journey. And this is actually not a user journey. I thought it was, and then I had a meeting with this guy at Lego, and he was like, actually, that's an internal document for when we want to book travel. But it still, is, it looks like a user journey, basically. <laughs> So it's a series of stages that people go through when they have a specific need that they're looking to fulfill. So in this case, they walk you through, you know, someone looking to go to Legoland. These are the different stages that they go through, right? And ultimately, you want to marry your content or map your content to those different stages. So in building user journeys, this is essentially the process that we use. I think officially it's called ethnographic research, but we start from the business goals, then we go to your keyword research, take those keywords, throw them in the social listening tools, and then also look at the social inventories like I was just showing you with Facebook Audience Insights. Also look at discussion search. See how people are using this vocabulary. See what they're specifically looking to do with this vocabulary. And then ultimately that's gonna start to yield a series of steps that users are going through on a regular basis. Or you could just use the standard consumer decision journey, which is basically the funnel. And the thing is that marketers actually struggle here. A lot of marketers are like, yeah, we're doing content, but we still haven't figured out how to map it to the user journey. We're just making things, because you don't have a strategy. And then a lot of marketers think, oh, that's something far down in the future. We can't do that now. There's nothing to measure that, right? Wrong. Google Analytics allows you to do that. With the content grouping um, feature in Google Analytics, you can map that very specifically to the user journey, and that's what we do. I wrote a blog post about it. It's not 12,000 words. It's actually pretty easy to do using Google Tag Manager. So in understanding your user journeys when you're building them out, you have to figure out what those stages are. And again, that's where you get from the, the series of steps that I talked about before. And then what you have to do is understand the user needs at those various different stages. So again, the keyword research specifically is gonna inform that. Based on the keywords that go in each of those buckets that you've identified, you'll be like, okay, these are the questions that people are looking to answer. These are the things that they're looking to do. And then align that with your touch points. So if you're doing content marketing across a variety of channels, then yes, you wanna look at it like, how does this work with email? How does this work with display? How does this work with um, organic search? But if you're just thinking about content as, you know, as itself, then yeah, you just want to align it with your different types of content. 
So here's an example of a user journey that we actually built. And you see how you know, we have the consumer tension. What is the overarching problem they're trying to solve? And then what are some of the questions that they have? And then what are the channels that these things happen in? And so once you have that user journey and you map your content to it, you'll then have a better understanding of where there's holes in your marketing funnel. So here's an example of a startup that I worked with here in Berlin, actually, called TripMe. And they are in the adventure travel space. So if you want to book a safari that's custom, you go to them, right? And what I realized in building out their user journey is that they only had content for these first two stages. Because exploring and booking was where they can make their money, and it made sense because they're a startup. They don't have much money to waste. So all their content was here. But the thing is, with their personas, these people want to be really educated about what might happen. Like, OK, I run into a problem while I'm on an African safari. What happens? So these people actually search for these things before they go ahead and book. And if you don't have the answer and Expedia does, then they go book on Expedia. So as soon as we started creating content for these other phases, they started popping up in the assisted conversions. And having content in those other phases led to more money. So when you do your content audit, there's two different ways you can do it. A sample-based audit, which is just reviewing some of the content, versus a population audit, which is reviewing all the content. And in calculating sample sizes, content strategists generally use this. Eh, that's cool. As far as I'm concerned, we, we do heavy market research, so I want accurate numbers. So we work from a sample size calculator like you would with anyone, anything else. So what you want to do is, is review both quantitative and qualitative metrics. And when I say quantitative, I mean the ones that you can pull without having someone actually look at something to determine what that number is or what that value is. So all these things that you see here can be pulled with URL profiler. Those will be your easy things to look at. And then you want to do your qualitative review. And I'm going to go through these things more specifically so we can understand what these are. But basically, these are the things that a human has to determine whether or not what these values are. So first thing is section, category, and what is it? Section is what section of the site is it in? So is it you know, um, in the shoes section of the site? Or is it in the um, you know, travel section of the site? versus categories, what type of page is it? So is it a product page? Is it a category page? Is it a blog post? And then what is it is just a short description of what this content is so that you don't have to go back and look at it again. Redundancy, is this content redundant, repetitive, useless? Um, is this content timely? Is it evergreen? Is it something that needs to be updated on a regular basis or not? And voice and tone. So, a lot of my clients don't come to us with a style guide for their brand. So we don't look at this as much. But if you do have a brand style guide, you want to be reviewing this content for whether or not it aligns with the brand considerations. And then quality. On a scale of one to three, how good is this content? And then actionability. On a scale of one to three, for the conversion goals that we're looking to make happen, how likely is that to happen on this page? And then link and share worthiness, how likely are people to share this content from your perspective? Or not just your perspective, but also the perspective of the target persona that this content is for. And then how likely is it to be linked to? And then conversion notes. What are the specific barriers to a conversion for this page? So is the CTA loss? Um, is the messaging unclear? Things like that. And then specific suggestions and comments of what we should do with this page. Should we repurpose this content? Should we delete it? Things like that. And so your first step is to determine the size of your audit. So given the number of pages that you know are on the site, are you going to go with the population audit or the um, sample-based audit? Then start with Screaming Frog. Throw that domain in there. Crawl all the pages. Get those URLs. Throw it in the URL profiler. These are the things that I typically look at. So links from Majestic, Moz, Ahrefs, uh, grab the HTTP status, the Google Analytics data, which is critical here, social shares, page speed, is it mobile friendly or not? And then import all that stuff into Excel, and then you're done. Just plan. 
Then you want to take your, your quant sheet and color code it because it's going to be overwhelming otherwise. And you know, obviously the values, you'll figure out which ones are better, which ones are worse. And you color code it based on that. And then you perform a qualitative review. But don't do it like this lady, because she's not even looking at the computer. Yes, you laughed. And then build your insights from there. So in fishing for insights, the best thing you can do from my perspective is use a pivot chart. This is the quickest way to figure out where there are issues. So the thing is, you can play with these all day until you get some cool insights, which is generally what we do. But typically, using page value from Google Analytics is the best measure of quantitative effectiveness. So we basically pivot off of that. And here are, here's one of the examples of the ones that we do every time. So reading difficulty versus page value. Are there a lot of pages that are hard to read that are not generating money? Generally speaking, this is what happens. If it's very confusing, no money is made here. So those are quick hits for figuring out where you want to do some conversion rate optimization. So keep doing those pivots until you get a story out of your data. And you'll notice I only quote me in these things. <laughs> Here's some uh, combinations that I like. You know, again, you'll have this to look at later, but we look at page value versus format, page value versus social shares, images versus readability score. We keep playing around until we see something that's actually valuable and not spurious. Um, you can have my content audit template, get you some Mike King to go. But there's more to talk about. So if you don't want to do any of that because you're like, oh, that's way too much work. Well, you can use Follower Wonk. Follower Wonk will help you come up with good ideas. Because what it does is it, it grabs the um, bios of all these users and then creates these word clouds. You put two of those ideas together, voila, you now have a content idea. And the thing about Follower Wonk is sometimes that the sample size of the users that it reviews is too small. So you can use Simply Measured's uh, free Twitter export, which will give you up to 10,000 users. And then take the bio column, throw it in the tag crowd, and you'll get that same type of word cloud. Bottlenose Sonar is a great tool for keyword research in that it allows you to review um, Twitter, basically. So you pop in a keyword in, you pop a keyword in, and uh, it'll tell you the co-occurring keywords on Twitter in these different conversations. And it'll give you this web of keywords that you can then take two ideas, put them together, come up with a content idea, and then you have a built-in audience that's talking about those two ideas that you can reach out to once you develop that piece of content. Quora is one of my favorite sources for ideas that we basically steal because people will write these ridiculously long posts about something I never thought about. And you can just basically take those ideas and then create another piece of content from it. And the best part is the really popular ones will have like 11,000 people following it. So you can then just reach out to those people and be like, yo, look what I made. I'm excited. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry at all. Who gives a shit? Um, so when it comes to keyword research, there's a variety of tools for that. But Keyword Tool I.O. is pretty great as far as identifying um, you know, long tail opportunities. And identifying key word opportunities that will lead into content ideas pretty easily. And this is an older screenshot. They've actually added a lot more features. Like you can get search volume with the tool now, too. It's really crushing everything else as far as like Uber suggests and all those other things. And if you don't want to do any of that, there's this tool called Utango where you can crowdsource ideas. There's literally creative directors just sitting around like, hey, who needs an idea? And you can just get them for free. It's amazing. I love the internet. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I talk a lot about personas, but if you want a more in-depth, detailed review of that, check out this presentation that I did. OK, now, we have our idea. We're ready to roll. We need some data. I said there's so much data out there. Let me get you some data. All right, you have your personas. You want to know specifically what pe these people think about something, right? You can use a tool like SurveyMonkey Audience. There's a number of survey platforms out there. I only talk about the stuff I use. So SurveyMonkey Audience is a tool where you can essentially poll a very specific audience. And then you can use that data to build custom experiences. There's also Google Consumer Surveys. I prefer SurveyMonkey because of the fact that People have to explicitly tell you what their demographics are and where, what type of work they do, whereas Google is inferring it from the, the uh, uh, database of affinity. So there's also Google public data. If you're looking for data from your government or something like that, 
Like you can get census data here, things like that from this data store. <clears throat> Marketing charts. Every time a client is like, so what are the trends in social media? I'm like, ha, 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 give me one minute. Marketing charts, and then boom, I got data right there. <laughs> I'm saying, I got to do things quickly. I got a lot of people that I work with. Um, Google Consumer Barometer is a good tool for getting a lot of data on like how people are um, interacting with consumer goods. All right, Zanran is a data search engine. Um, you can search for data. Data Market, also a data search engine. Of these data search engines I'm going to show you, Zanran is the best, but I just want to give you more options. Get the Data is like a more curated data store. Data360, also a data search engine, but specifically with a bent toward news. OK, you got data now. You got an idea. But you can't code. You can't draw. can't write. So how are you going to outsource these good ideas that you have? OK, there's 99 designs. And some of you may have already heard of 99 designs, so let me caveat this. Um, if you spend 99 bucks, you're going to get bullshit. But if you spend like 750 bucks, you're going to get great stuff. And the other thing, well, the way that it works is essentially it's a design contest, right? And you post your brief, and then people you know, submit uh, designs based on that. And if you don't want to do it that way, you can actually reach out directly to a designer in your area that fits your criteria. So Dribbble or Behance or any number of these portfolio sites are searchable so you can find like a UI designer or illustrator and then look through their stuff and you find somebody that makes the type of stuff that you like and you reach out to them and say, hey, let me buy some design from you. Contently, um, they are a network, well, they're a software platform first you know, for managing editorial calendars and writers and such. But they also have a network of writers on the back end where you can source content from them. And they're not going to be cheap. They're going to be higher end writers that write for, you know, like journalists that write for like the New York Times and things like that and whatever the equivalent is here. I should know that. I've been here 40 times. I'm sorry. Um, Skyward is just like that. Again, a software platform with a network of writers on the back end, but it's actually a, a little cheaper than Contently is. And then news credit is the same thing, except their USP is that you can purchase news content directly from them. So for example, if you want to get an article from the New York Times and have it on your website, which I would not suggest for SEO purposes, but if you did want to do that, you can buy that through them. And then there's CopyPress. CopyPress is similar in that they have a network of content creators, but there's no software, so there's no overhead in working with them. And they can create content of all types, you know, writing, uh, design, data visualization, all that type of stuff, even video, live action video too. So you have all this content coming in, and you want to make sure it's original. Plague tracker. You want to make sure the grammar's okay, because you suck at writing, grammarly. All right, now we have this workflow. I told you it was coming back. So we start from the audit using URL profiler and Screaming Frog. We get our ideas together, and we do our brainstorming murally. We highlight everything in Trello as we go. Um, we get some ideas from Bottlenose and, and Quora and Follower Wonk. Get our data from SurveyMonkey. We get our design, our copy from Dribble, Contently, and uh, 99 Designs. But we've already laid out that wireframe there for those people to create stuff. And also that storyboard with storyboard that. We get them to create the content. We check it for uh, whether or not it's original and also checking for grammar. We go back to these sources, get them to fix it, and then we launch it. And then we make a note in uh, Asana that it needs to be maintained. OK, now, you've gone through the process of outsourcing. Maybe you loved it, maybe you didn't. Maybe you can't afford outsourcing. So you want to do some stuff yourself. This is for the case where you can write, where you can make a spreadsheet, and where you can take pictures. Upload pictures. Take a selfie. It's your boy. All right, then you can make create content by yourself, right? So there's Infogram for making infographics. And they have a bunch of different um, templates that you can use, essentially. You plug your copy and stuff in there, and then boom, you have an infographic. PictoChart, very similar to Infogram, except PictoChart actually has the um, video infographics you can build with their tool as well. And then, Again, you have data. You want to create some sort of cool data visualization. Google Fusion Tables. 
also eye charts just like that. Both of these tools, you can basically set up a Google Sheet, bring it into the tool, visualize, visualize the data in any number of ways. And then <clears throat> you want to make an interactive timeline. But again, you can't code, you can't draw, but you have pictures, you have copy. You upload the pictures, copy, and video to a tool called Dippity. Voila, you have an interactive timeline. Storybird, you want to make an interactive book. Again, all you need is copy, pictures, and that's it. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that you need to know as somebody who has never done design before is that you need to be color coordinated. And that might be difficult for some of you. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not saying no names because I don't know any. But um, color, which is the Adobe product, where creative people basically upload color schemes that you can use. You can search based on different moods and keywords and find the one that fits you. And I believe this one fits me. All right. And then the other thing is if you're building any type of content, one of your limitations is the fonts that everyone has. And so this has long been an issue with the web because everybody has different fonts, right? And Adobe has something called Typekit. Google has something called the Google Font API. Typekit is really expensive. Font API is free, but it didn't have that many fonts. They got together and made a product called Adobe Edge Fonts, which has over 500 fonts for you to choose from for free. And again, if you don't know anything about design, but you want to make your stuff look decent, you want to check out this uh, email course on design called Hack Design. So workflow again. You see where the beginnings are all the same, but when you go to create the stuff, you use color, Storybird, infogram. OK, now, going back to that idea of outsourcing things, right? Oftentimes, you get the opportunity to make a content project. You're excited. You're like, yes, we're making content. Then you get your content back, and you're like, shit, that's not what I thought it was. And the reason for that is because we as marketers are not good at communicating with creative people. We say, oh, we just want a simple design, make something clean. What does that mean to anybody? I don't even know what that means. And I've said it before. So I wrote this long blog post a few years back where I reached out to people from Airbnb, uh, people from Urban Outfitters, and asked them what was their approach to creating some of these more popular pieces of content that came out around the time. And what I realized is there were some commonalities in how they were communicating with creatives. And I got with my creative director at the time. I said, why don't we do something like this? And what that was is what we call a data viz brief. So it includes a brief explanation of the audience. It includes the story and the background of the content, has the data, has the copy, has examples for look and feel, and also has a wireframe. So then it's not just like, oh, here's some stuff. Make me something simple and clean. Like, no, you have some very specific direction on what I want. And so here's an example of what you know, some of that stuff looks like. So the audience is very brief. It's not as in-depth as the personas that we talked about. The story, again, very brief. And all this stuff is, is laid out in a way where they don't have to read too much, but they can get some good ideas flowing, right? And then we provide the data. We provide the specific curated data points and also whatever else is available so they can you know, look at what else we got just in case they want to be more creative. And then we have the wireframe. And then on the right was the end result of this one that we did. Of course, the infographic is too big for me to show you the full thing. But we're actually really happy with how it came out. OK, now, one last thing, content promotion. So everybody thinks you can just put content out and you're going to like magically get traffic. Like content is like this field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. That's not how it works. So I'm going to give you guys a few tactics to help you promote your content. And then we're going to end with just some ways to think about how to approach content promotion. So one, um, Brian Dean, he talks about these a lot, the, what he calls the content upgrades, where if you have pre-existing content that's doing well, add a downloadable asset to it to increase your lead generation. And what I would actually add to that is give people two options when you add these content upgrades. So of course you want their email address in most cases, but there is a subset of the population that will never give you their email address. So what you can do is give them something, another option called pay with the tweet. 
And so the way that Pay With The Tweet works is they effectively have to promote your content in order to get your content. So that way they essentially tweet it out and then they're able to download it. And Pay With The Tweet is not limited to just Twitter. It's just called Pay With The Tweet. But you can also pay with a Facebook share. And I think it basically works on every social channel that you can share stuff at this point. And we've done this a lot in the past. We've actually combined this with guest posting, and it works really well. Uh, there's also a tool called Snipply, where essentially when you create this URL short shortener and you're sharing a piece of content, you can have your own CTA within that content. So as you see right here, here's my CTA, or not my CTA, the example CTA, uh, from when someone is sharing a New York Times article. So you're going to continually be sharing stuff yourself. You might as well be driving people back to your own content with it. And then also click to tweet. So when you have something compelling that you say within a blog post or within any type of content that you create, if you add that click to tweet button there, a lot more people are being compelled to tweet it. And then there's a, uh, there's a variety of different networks like Triber, where you can create this group of people that is a group of influencers on a given topic who all commit to sharing your content when you put it out. But of course, you have to share their content, otherwise they're not going to share yours. But there's also a paid side of it where you can pay an influencer to tweet your content for them. And then guest posting. Google is against this, of course. But honestly, I don't care what Google thinks. Um, <laughs> Jan Willem, that was your cue. That's when you tweet me. Anyway, um, so yeah. Continuing to guest post for populations or websites where there are populations that are full of your target audience or at least influence your target audience will um, yield a lot of outsized returns, especially if you combine it with what, what I was saying with the uh, pay with the tweet. So typically what we do is we'll, we'll guest post, no, we'll create an asset that is like a bigger picture asset. And we have one coming out next week. It's the uh, complete guide to Google Tag Manager. And so what we'll do is we'll do a guest post that's like a tangential topic that links back to that complete guide. But you position a CTA within that post that's relevant, and then people go back to that content. And essentially, there's that landing page where they can then pay with a tweet. So let's say you go to a site that has 100,000 people going to it on a, regular, on a monthly basis. Some percentage of that 100,000 will look at your piece of content go back to your landing page and ultimately end up promoting your content for you. So guest posting is still very key here. And then um, another content promotion tactic, you know, look for core threads that are relevant to your content and add a response with the link to your content. You'd be surprised how many people are using Quora and will then click that link and go back to you and then also end up linking to that content as well. And then also stop forgetting about your mailing list. Again, email is not sexy. So people don't think, oh, let me fire this out to this very specific population or segment of my mailing list who will ultimately share this content or at least view this content. If you have a big list, you send one email. I don't know how many of you guys are SEOs, but like if you've ever been on the Moz Top 10, I get so much traffic from that. Email marketing is still very key. And also, you know, posting quotes and in social media. So going back to the idea of click to tweet, where click to tweet is your users posting those um, quotes for you, you can do it yourself. As long as they're compelling, people will retweet and click and such. And then having good visuals, good metadata for your content for social is bar none one of the most effective things you can do for your content. A lot of people, when they think about metadata, they're just like, oh, I'll just do my page title and my meta description. That's enough. That's not true because there are different mindsets that people are in for each different channel. So metadata is all about making the best first impression with your content in that channel. So you gotta remember, people that are on Twitter are more looking for that headline news type uh, content, whereas people on Facebook are stalking their ex-girlfriend, so they need to be surprised by something. So creating the right metadata is always gonna be important. I encourage you all to check out this uh, content promotion ebook from Buzzstream, but I'm just gonna leave you guys with a couple formulas that they have in this ebook for you to determine you know, the best ways to uh, do your content promotions. So essentially, you have to start from your goals. If you have a goal number of leads, you gotta know how many, um, what, your, what your lead 
qualification rate looks like? What is your conversion rate? So you basically back those numbers into the hard numbers that you're trying to go after. Same thing works with the download goal as well. And then for spend across channels, again, it goes back to that goal of how many views do you want and then how much spend is that going to take. That's how you're going to get to the views per, per dollar that you should expect. And then the same thing with link building. So for outreach, you need to figure out what is your conversion rate on outreach. If you're converting at 20%, but you need 100 links, do the math. <laughs> I didn't feel like doing it in my head. Um, so yeah, basically you have to work off that. And you know, a lot of people have a lower conversion rate for um, outreach than 20%, but you can use that if you've never done outreach before. So wrapping up, thank you all for having me here. Um, you know, a word from our sponsor, which is me. We do this stuff, consulting and training. We do this stuff. That's all I got.